All right, everybody, thank you so much for coming to this panel for uh, We Know Who We Are, the um, or Aspects Pride Month LGBTIQA plus autistics panel. Mm. It's really exciting to be here. Um, so the reason this panel is happening is because two key actions as part of Aspects LGBTIQA plus engagement plan are about acknowledging and celebrating and participating in days of significance for the LGBTIQA plus community. And so organizing events that can help raise awareness in that space. And also to identify gaps and develop new resources that will benefit the autistic community, particularly uh, in the intersections of autism and LGBTIQA plus or queer and intersex identities. Uh, the Aspect LGBTIQ plus advisory committee um, have been working in partnership with Aspect staff to host this event during June, which is now Australia's Pride Month too. We stole it from the US like Halloween. And it's also an opportunity to have an open dialogue with the parallels of autistic and LGBTIQA plus pride. And initially this panel was in a response to questions from the Aspect staff, participants and students and families to better understand diverse sexualities and gender identities and intersex status and autism. So we hope this session will support all attendees to listen and learn from the direct experiences of LGBTIQA plus autistic people and the inclusion work that Aspect is committing to. So uh, I'll introduce, oh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge that we are all meeting on stolen land from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, for me, I'm on, on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulwin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander or First Nations person here today. Hi everyone, I just wanted to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands where I'm meeting on today. Um, I'm working from the lands of the Bidjigal and Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So I'd like to pay my respects to them, their elders um, and to their emerging leaders um, and welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Um. I'm attending this meeting from the land of the Camarago people of the Eora Nation and I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and I would also like to extend that respect to any uh, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people present here today. And I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm meeting from today, the Ngunnawal people, and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Hello, I'm um, tuning in from Gadigal country, but I'm a Wiradjuri person. So I was born and born on Wiradjuri country and that's, that's my people. So I want to acknowledge the Gadigal people and thank them for welcoming, on, welcoming me onto their land, including the elders who have allowed me to, to be on this land and be involved in their community um, and extend my welcome and um, acknowledgement to all other um, Aboriginal people who are here today and Torres Strait Islander here today. Uh, Torres Strait Islander people here today. Um, I'm with you, I'm a brother boy, and we're deadly and we're strong and we're awesome. I'm fighting in from Yugambe land, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and also extend that welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people watching today. Very well. All right, um, I'm going to be introducing all the panelists now. So first, um, we have uh, Timothy Locklet. Timothy uses he, him pronouns and identifies as an autistic, disabled, gay, trans man. He is a wheelchair motocross athlete, WCMX, uh, a third year occupational therapy student and a fabricator. He fabricates custom equipment that help people skate and improves uh, and promotes skating for its occupational therapy benefits. He hopes to improve the ways therapists and society communicate and interact with autistic and disabled people. Thanks, Tim. Um, Yen. Uh, Yen Perkis is an autistic and non-binary author, presenter and advocate. Yen has written several books, seven books on elements of autism and is a passionate advocate for the rights of autistic people. Yen facilitates the Canberra Autism Women's Group and has had several media engagements. Yen also works in the Australian Public Service. Thanks, Yen. Renee, Renee Christie is a proud ally working at the Aspect, in, as, working as Aspect Inclusion Officer at Autism Spectrum Australia for the last year. 
This role facilitates the implementation and evaluation of the Disability Access and Inclusion Innovate Reconciliation Action Plan and Multicultural and LGBTIQA plus engagement plans. Renee is driven by her relationships with people and finds work, family and social networks connect her with some incredibly interesting and diverse people. Hayden Moon. Hayden is a Wadri a brother boy who acts as a representative for the transgender, disabled and Aboriginal communities. He is a co-founder of Trans Action Warang. Warang, is that correct? Sweet. A trans, uh, auto autonomous activist, uh, a trans autonomous activist collective. Hayden has completed a Bachelor of Arts with first class honours and is currently studying a Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Sydney. He's also a 2020 Pinnacle Foundation Scholar. Hey Hayden. Kerry Chin. Kerry is autistic, aromantic, asexual, and transgender. He is a member of the Aspect LGBTIQA plus advisory committee and the organizer of autistic adult social groups on Meetup. He also works as an electrical engineer and is a network liaison officer in his workplace disability network. Hey, Kerry. And quickly, my name is Ruby Mountford. I'm an, I'm an autistic bisexual advocate who is based in Melbourne. My, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm I'm also on the LGBTIQA plus advisory committee. I am the education officer at Melbourne Bisexual Network, and I work as the disability inclusion officer at Thorn Harbour Health, formerly the Victorian AIDS Council. And it's great to be here. All right, it, as, um, as you might have seen, you've got some questions. You can submit questions uh, throughout the panel and we'll get to them um, as we do. Um, but first we're gonna start with talking about some of the stuff that we thought might be interesting for all of you. Um, so I'm gonna start with a question for Kerry. Kerry, um, one of the things that you've mentioned before we came to the panel was that uh, there were some challenges you experienced in being out of access transitioning, which is, so can you talk about how things have changed for you since you transi transitioned and how you managed to overcome some of the obstacles? So firstly, um, challenges in transitioning can be divided between um, the most immediate being um, the actual issues with the medical transition side. Um, so in the when I went through the process, um, the first step was to uh, get an approval letter from a psychiatrist. So I specifically selected um, a doctor who is known to um, uh, provide transition care for transgender people and uh, so the GP referred me to this psychiatrist and when I went into the psychiatrist the first thing he wanted to focus the first thing he said was um, asking me with whether I have heard of autism spectrum disorders and uh, I find I found that to be a problem because I think uh, in the time I spent with the psychiatrist he wanted to focus on my autism rather than um, addressing uh, my gender experience. Um, he also wanted me to um, invite my parents along for a group session and that was an while I acknowledge that there is potential benefit in such a session, um, it was also a, an unrealistic request because um, my parents were not supportive of my transition at the time. Uh, um, and in the addition to that, uh, one of the things he asked me was whether I had any sexual fantasies. So my honest answer was no, and in particular being asexual, um, that's, it makes sense in context, although it should also be acknowledged that some asexual people might have um, sexual fantasies anyway, but um, not myself. And um, his response was that um, I should watch some pornography and uh, find out more about um, sex, which I consider that to be an inappropriate response. Um, over later on, um, I did eventually get that approval, um, but uh, the I think the way the letter was worded was also somewhat um, unflattering, as uh, he he was saying that it's like he couldn't find any reasons that I shouldn't transition. So that was um, the best he could say. But um, 
later on, I went back to the same psychiatrist to get the approval for my top surgery. By then, I had been on hormones for a few years, and um, going on hormones has made quite a big change to, to my life overall. Um, while I uh, do not have any anxiety disorders, um, I used to be a very anxious person, and uh, starting on testosterone has um, greatly stabilized my mood and I, I'm i back to being the fairly chill person that I used to be um, before puberty. Um, there's more to say. Uh, sorry. Um, and that was only part of the issue, but um, of course I also had social issues um, such as um, some people who uh, considered themselves my friends um, said unsupportive things. So those are no longer my friends. Um, it's okay, I still have plenty. Uh, my parents were also initially unsupportive, but um, I should acknowledge that um, I, or I still have it easier than a lot of people I know. Um, while my parents were initially unsupportive, uh, we never completely fell out and I actually still live in their home. And over time, they got used to it. Um, by that logic also, um, I also have it relatively easy in that I knew very clearly early on what I wanted. And uh, being transgender, um, I always knew that I was really a boy, but um, it wasn't until university years went before I, um, I finally found out that it was actually a feasible course of action to transition. I actually waited until after I finished university to pursue medical transition because I was um, trying to prepare for the worst. I was kind of expecting my parents to, I wasn't entirely expecting it, but I wanted to be prepared in case my parents disown me over it. Um, also later on, um, when my GP was to write me the referral letter to um, the surgeon. Uh, she mentioned certain details such as how long I had been on hormones for, which was fair. But, um, and then she also mentioned that um, my work as an electrical engineer. So I asked her, um, what does my occupation have to do with getting an operation? And she, and um, as I happen to have a fairly um, stereotypically male-dominated occupation, um, she was she thought she would clarify that it's not about what I do, um, any perceived gender roles of my job, but just the fact that I have a job. It's seen as a sign of um, that I have. Um, good enough mental health to be able to cope with the transition, which I find, while well, that's not a problem for myself, I find that um, somewhat inappropriate in its unfortunate implications in that um, both autistic and transgender people are disproportionately likely to be unemployed. And if you use employment as a sign of good health, then um, that's inherently excluding a lot of people. Okay, could I ask a question about, people have been asking about the flags that are behind you. So people recognize the trans flag in the middle, but what are the other two flags that you have in your background? So this one with the green stripe at, at on top and then going to a lighter green and white and gray and black, this is the aromantic flag. And um, aromanticism is defined as um, someone who does not experience romantic attraction, which is distinct from asexuality. And so this one is the asexual flag. Um, that's the, with the black stripe, gray stripe, white and purple. Um, yeah, it's always confusing where remembering which way is the top where. Good thing the trans flag doesn't have that problem because it's vertically <laughs> symmetrical. But um, yeah, it's like ace flag has the 
so yeah, asexuality is defined as uh, not experiencing sexual attraction to people of any gender. Um, it should be noted that um, these two are distinct from each other in that um, some people who do not experience sexual attraction still experience romantic at attraction and vice versa. I happen to be these, both of these happen to be true for myself and uh, the aromantic community as it currently exists, I think, uh, started out as kind of part of the asexual community and then it was recognized that um, some of their issues are different and they form their own separate community as well. Thank you so much. I, um, I should also have mentioned it. So during this uh, panel, some of the things we're talking about are going to be our own experiences of things that are really upsetting. So if you find yourself being distressed, please do take care of yourself. Please feel free to step back if you need to. As someone has asked, there's going to be a recording and transcript later, so you'll be able to access it in your own time if that's going to be easier for you. Um, we'll do our best to try and uh, now, like, now that I remember to say it, we'll do our best to try and flag when we're going to be talking about things that might be distressing. Uh, but with people, we, we might slip up on that. So just uh, please make sure that you're um, looking after yourselves in that way and being honest with your feelings and not thinking like you've got to sit through something that is really distressing you. Um, I would recommend if you are an LGBTIQA plus person, you can always call uh, QLife on one 800 184 after three. They've also got a web chat if you Google QLife in case you're uh, not a verbal person. They've got that too, which is great. Um, thank you so much for sharing, Kerry. That was really great. Um, I think that kind of brings into an interesting point. I wanted to, so transitioning is, I, I think I can say none of us except for, except for Renee are cis people on this panel. And that is something that, you know, uh, it, people have mentioned around autism that there is a lot uh, where we're more likely to be trans and or gender diverse and or, and or non-binary than non-autistic people. Um, now, this often causes, this is starting to lead some conversations in the media, which can be really harmful for the autistic community, uh, particularly some recent comments by high profile people. Um, in your experience, and this is to everyone, why do we think that autistic people are more likely to be trans and or gender diverse or on a binary? And what is everyone's thoughts on that? Um, yeah. Well, okay, I'm going to start with Hayden. Hello. Um, sorry, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, so I forgot to mention I'm autistic in my bio. Um, but yeah, by the way, I'm autistic. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be on this panel. Um, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's really important to point out why um, there is a higher level of trans people in the autistic community. I think there's a lot of negativity going around out there, specifically, like you said, by some high profile people, which is really hurtful for the autistic community and the trans community. And I think that, you know, one of the things that was said was quite, quite harmful in that we're being coerced or something like that. Um, and, you know, I had someone say to me last night that autistic people are all stupid. And I was like, well, I'm doing a PhD, so pretty sure I'm not stupid. Um, you know, but there is like, there are these really negative um, assumptions that autistic people aren't smart enough to make their own decisions or we're not independent enough to make our own decisions and we're being coerced into things. And I think we really need to um, step away from that kind of understanding and educate people. Um, it's really important that people know that the reason why, um, well, one, one of the reasons why there is a higher level of transgender people in the autistic community is because we see the world differently. You know, it has nothing to do with being coerced or being, um, you know, told to think certain ways about ourselves. It's the fact that, you know, society is so uh, entrenched with these boxes that people have to fit into and these social rules and these social norms that we as autistic people don't subscribe to you know like i don't understand these weird social rules that society has and you know when you really unpack them they it's really hard to understand where these social rules came from so as autistic people who don't understand these very rigid social rules that came out of you know wider um societal issues that's not something that we're going to subscribe to. So we feel much more free to explore our gender and explore our sexuality and not feel tied down by what society tells us that we should do. So, you know, it's, I think it's something that should be celebrated. The fact that autistic people are more likely to be trans because it's a good thing. It means that we're not as likely to be forced into this little box that society tells us that we should be. Um, so that's me. <laughs> Lovely. 
yeah, it's a, I think there's definitely been a, um, some strong word responses and the idea of people trying to speak for us. And um, as part of the theme for our Mardi Gras float this year, which Kerry was a part in organizing, we got to a t-shirt that said nothing about us without us. And I think often if people do want to speak about the autistic people and why we might be trans and or gender diverse, it's probably important they talk to us about that and what our experiences are like with that as opposed to assume they know what's best because it's not great. Um, now, we're gonna move on. So, Yen, um, we've got a question for you next. So, Yen, you were already a very established autistic advocate when you came out as non-binary. And so often people assume that you know when you're trans at a quite young age, but sometimes we find out later in life. So can you tell us a bit about how you came to realize um, your identity? Definitely. That's a great question. I'm 45. I turn 46 next month. So I'm maybe a bit older than others in the group. Um, and so when I was younger, there weren't really options for gender diversity. I'd heard of transgender because I had a, um, a my dad's second cousin or someone was trans, but it was the, the language around it was horrific. You know, it was not, it was not a very inclusive world back then. And it was all, it was all seen as rather strange. I, that, that's, I was interested by that because I felt a fellow feeling and I always felt like I, I didn't really belong in the gender that I'd been given, that I really wanted to be something of a third option, but there wasn't a third option presented in the 1980s. And so I went through life with my very gendered name and you know, all those gendered expectations that I didn't quite know how to live up to and I felt very uncomfortable. And I thought that um, gender and sexuality were the same thing. And a lot of people still think that. And if you think that, look up the gender bred person um, because that's a really good illustration of why gender and sexuality and romantic attraction and sex characteristics and all those other things are not the same thing. Um, but for me, I figured that um, I must be gay because I wasn't interested in, in men and I was, you know, I was sort of gender diverse, but I, I understood that as lesbianism and being gay. And so I tried to be gay, but I'm also like Kerry, I'm asexual and aromantic, so it didn't really work. And then in recent years, I started to learn a lot more about gender diversity. And I had a lot of friends in the autistic community who were trans and gender diverse. And we got talking and I started thinking, hang on, maybe this is me. Maybe, you know, I actually have a divergent gender identity. And I started really embracing this and just testing the waters because it was a big thing. It's a big thing to know about yourself. And I remember going to a conference in Western Australia in about 2016 and they had drinks after the event and I was talking to this person and I said, oh, and they asked me about gender and sexuality and I said, look, I think I'm um, non-binary and it was the first time I'd ever used the words and I'm like, oh, oh, this is me. And then from there, I started testing it more and thinking more about it and in May 2018, I came out as non-binary publicly. Um, I posted on my Facebook page and had a lot of responses, but I still had my dead name and my dead name was very female gendered. Um, it had an E-double-T-E at the end of it, you know, one of those names and I wasn't comfortable with it. And I thought this doesn't go with who I am, but I didn't know what to change it to. And I tried to force the issue. I tried to, oh, I'll, I'll think up a name. I couldn't think up a name, it wouldn't work. And then in February last year, I was sitting at work and suddenly the word yen popped into my brain. And I thought, yen. And I wrote down Y-E-N-N-E. -N -E, and I thought, no, and I crossed that out. I wrote Y-E-N-N-E, -N -N, I'm like, yes. And what I'd done was subconsciously um, in, in my brain, I've been thinking about the ideas around my name without consciously thinking. And I realized that yen was meaningful in several ways. So I'm very poetic and to yen in poetry is to yearn. And so I do a lot of self-reflection. And actually the last question I wanted to offer an answer to about self-reflection, because autistic people, we think about our identity a lot because we have to, because we live in a world that doesn't respect our identity. And to be proud as autistic people is really important and that's a real liberation um, and so that's 
that yearning, that questioning our self-identity means we're more likely to be, to know that we're trans than to not know we're trans because, you know, we're thinking about this stuff. This stuff is important to us and we reflect on ourselves mm. who we are and what makes us who we are. But with my name, it was also um, a sort of bit of a nod to my dead name, but it was also in Australia, Yen is not a gendered name and no one's ever heard Yen. They go, oh, where's that from? I said, it's from my brain. Um, but yeah, so now I'm very established as a, a non-binary person. And one of the lovely things about being a non-binary person with a following, and I do have a following, um, is that it encourages other people to be able to come out and to be able to be open about who they are. Had a lovely experience last year. I was staying with a friend in Melbourne and their child um, had just come out as non-binary. I came down the stairs and my friend said to their child, Yen uses they, them pronouns too. And this kid's face just absolutely lit up and it was a beautiful thing and I think that's that's the best thing about having a profile and being non-binary is that you know I can I can make non-binary kids really happy because here's this cool adult who, well I hope I'm a cool adult, <laughs> cool adult who's um who's also like me so I, you mentioned before that you know you grew up without having those that language to kind of explain your experience so being able to kind of share that language with other people and see if it resonates is really really important thank you so much friend Yen. Oh, Ren, where'd that come from? That's my boss. Um, uh, now, my next question is for, for Tim. We, this question was submitted uh, from Megan. Now, how do, you how do you feel sports and gym and rec supports, um, how are they including people with disability who are also LGBTIQA plus? Uh, do they tend to pigeonhole or, do they, I, or are they able to acknowledge a person's whole identity? Uh, in my experience, it, it depends where you are, really. Um, I often joke I'm from somewhere very backwards, also known as Queensland, which uh, in Queensland, uh, in particular, like LGBT supports and stuff, they're kind of non-existent, they sort of exist. But uh, in relation to sport, um, well, in Queensland at least, I haven't really seen any promotion of including LGBT plus people um, in more progressive places like Victoria, I have seen some actual, I guess, attempts or at least uh, motions in the right direction. So um, going off what I've seen in Victoria, they have, well, this is going off what I've seen with Disability Sport and Rec, they've actually made attempts to include gender diverse people when they have uh, i believe it's like an award ceremony they do maybe once or twice a year and they are uh, included i guess gender non-diverse people or people who um, identify as one gender so that in my opinion is a really good start to actually acknowledge that there are lgbt people who are also disabled and I guess a way to make that more accessible to people is to advertise that your business or your organization or whatever is LGBT plus friendly. But yeah. And what is sport, how is sport, you mentioned in your bio that you really think skating particularly has a lot of therapeutic value. So what has sport helped you with? Uh, personally, Sport for me, it gives me an outlet and I feel that is a very common theme for not just autistic people, but everybody who does sport. It's, it's something to do. It's a way to put your energy into something positive. Uh, for me, when I'm in the skate park and stuff, flying around the bowls, I'm not thinking about my problems. I'm just enjoying what I'm doing. And that for me, is sort of a form of therapy mentally, but it can also be a form of physical therapy, which is what I use it for when I work with clients. I use it as an alternative to occupational therapy, really. And um, I suppose there's also an element of like structured social interaction with things like skate parks where you can take it in turns and interact in that way. Have you found that that's helpful to have tasks to do? I know I do. Uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu and I found it a way to do a sport where I could have conversations that were focused on a particular thing was really helping me with my anxiety around socializing. 
Yeah, that, that's exactly it, having some sort of structure. But uh, skateboarding isn't really as structured. It's kind of a choose your own type thing, which I really enjoy. And also when I'm out there skating, I've got like a full face helmet on. Nobody's usually bugging me with <laughs> talk to me. I'm usually just there to escape everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I've just got, thank you. I've just got a question. Oh, uh, so the, uh, Sophie's asking what skating is referring to. I'm guessing it's not, uh, they're guessing it's not ice skating, but probably skateboarding. Just to confirm, are we talking about skateboarding? Yeah, like skateboarding in the skate park setting. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Um, so, and you mentioned that you make custom boards for people with disabilities. Is that people who might be using, um, like who are wheelchair users or, um, or uh, mobility aid users? Yeah, so I do a variety of custom things. I've just started manufacturing now that I've got my workshop all set up finally. Uh, but yeah, I do custom skateboards. So for instance, there's a skateboard um, I can build that has like a frame on top. So somebody who's paralyzed would be able to sort of sit, stand on the board and uh, use some handles to, I guess, navigate which way the board goes. Or also like um, there's different types of wheelchairs I can make. Like I make ones with suspension in them so you can drop them off massive gaps and roll away from it without getting crushed. That's not, um, that sounds really, that sounds amazing. I think someone's asked for your deets for some clients based in Brisbane. So maybe we had to start getting some, getting some commissions. Um, oh, and Kerry has another comment as well. Can I check that in the chat box? Um, my next question is for Hayden. Hayden. Uh, why is it important that you can bring your whole self uh, and be seen as your whole self when you go, whether it's to work or to uni or, or if you, you know, when you're younger to school, why is that really important to you? Um, yeah, that's a big question. Um, I think there's so many different elements uh, to answer with that question. Um, but where do I even start? I mean, you can't, you can't do your best at university or work or, um, any kind of environment if you don't feel safe to be who you are. Um, that's, that's my main answer. Um, I guess for myself, um, because I'm an intersectional person, like I'm Aboriginal, I'm transgender, I'm autistic, I'm legally blind, um, that brings with it a lot of um, stigma. And I know for myself, you know, internalized stuff is, is very real for a lot of people. And especially when you're concerned about how you're gonna be treated in the workplace, a lot of the time I kind of pick and choose which part of my identity I'm going to show. And it's not because I want to do that, but it's because I'm worried that, you know, I have so many things going on that I don't want to be like too annoying or like too much of a burden or something like that, um, which is absolutely incorrect and no one should feel that, but society makes us feel that way, right? Um, and you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't have to be worried about, you know, going to work, whether it's like, okay, um, right, what can't I hide? What can I hide? Okay, I might be able to hide the fact I'm autistic. Um, can't hide the fact I'm blind. Can't hide the fact I'm trans. Mm, I don't always get read as black. Maybe I can pretend that I'm just, you know, a, a different race or something. Like you shouldn't have to go through that in your mind of like, which part of my identity am I going to, uh, am I going to be able to show in order to not be discriminated against too much? Because I'm already this thing and I don't want to be too many things because every single one of those things brings with it discrimination. And that's not something that someone should be doing. And it like, it also, it's a really difficult thing to do. You know, if you're sitting in the workplace or at university or at school and you're sitting there spending every waking moment trying to hide a part of who you are, that's really, really hard to do. It's so hard to do. It's, it, it hurts your mental health to hide a part of who you are. Like I'm really proud of all my identities. So to have to hide the fact that I'm autistic or to have to try and hide my race, like that's really, really hard and it's really sad and no one should have to do that. You know, you should be able to feel comfortable in your workplace to be like, I'm all of these things. I'm, you know, I'm autistic, I'm, I'm trans, I'm queer, I'm black, I'm, you know, I'm blind, like, and not have to worry that someone's gonna be shitty about it. Sorry for the swear. No. And do you think as well that that the ability to connect with people on your identity is a lot easier when you are able to be open about it as well? I think what Yen was saying about talking about being non-binary and finding that language when we are able to be ourselves and bring ourselves into spaces, it can help other folks find their way mm -hmm. uh, and find um, the language to describe their own experiences, which is hard to do if we don't get to talk about any experience that falls outside of 
mm. whatever society has decided is normal, which is generally a bit different to our experience. Um, thank you so much, Hayden. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that one? Or um, Could I add to the previous question? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to add um, to Tim's question. Um, I'll be trying to be really quick, but I'm a competitive Irish dancer. I do a lot of things. Um, and I was the first transgender person to be able to legally compete in that sport. Um, and in order to do that, I underwent, <laughs> thank you, I underwent a lot of fighting with the anti-discrimination board, with lawyers, um, and, you know, a lot of self-advocacy to fight the Australian Irish Dancing Association to allow them to um, let transgender people compete as, as themselves. And um, I just wanted to point out basically what, what Tim was saying in that, you know, it, it can be quite hard as a trans person and a queer person, um, a particularly a young trans or queer person um, in sporting environments, particularly for something like Irish dancing, which is very conservative. Um, you know, the fact that it's, it was 2019 and I was the first trans person that they've ever had compete, you know, says a lot about the sport. Um, so it can be really hard. But I think, um, you know, and, and also what Yen was saying, like one of the best things about that, which also ties into being able to be yourself in the workplace or at school or in Irish dancing, or whatever sport you do, the fact that I was the first trans person, openly trans person competing, I had a 12 year old child come up to me at a competition who was like, mommy told me that you said that trans people can compete and I've just started using he, him pronouns and I'm gonna dance as a boy. And you know, and like, to have a 12 year old kid come up to you who hasn't been able to talk about who they are and hasn't been able to feel like they could use he him pronouns and they could compete as a boy in Irish dancing to say that to me like that just goes back to what Yen was saying about like being open about who you are as a trans person as a disabled person as a queer person it helps so many people that you don't even realize it helps like I'd never met this little girl uh, sorry this little boy um and they you know they came up to me and just told me how much it meant to them that they could now start using he him pronouns and they could now move from competing in the girls section to the boys section and that's the kind of um yeah the kind of work that can be done um yeah <laughs> hayden um and before hayden i had a conversation off panel about how the gender neutral term for a lord or lady of the dance is a deity of the dance so non-binary Irish dancers are all deities of dance and it's great. Um, we have a question in from Joe. Uh, so um, I think how do folks on the panel approach being open about your autism, people who you feel may not be able to understand it? Context of the question is I'm open about my sexuality because I feel as though society has progressed enough with their understanding of sexuality and most people I encounter get it enough to accept it. When it comes to autism, however, I'm not open about it because I feel as though people don't understand it and make judgments based on this lack of understanding. My diagnosis was made uh, seven years ago and I'm still understanding it myself. Um, I might have a go at answering this one. I was only diagnosed five years ago. So I understand that it's, a, it's tricky when you kind of live your life thinking you're one thing and then you get to find out and have to have a really massive rethink of who you are. And I definitely went through a lot of fear and shame of being discovered as an autistic person because a lot of the messages I had internalized uh, around autism were based on, again, a lack of understanding and a really narrow understanding of what autism is. Um, and I think what really changed for me in that space was when I met other autistic people and could see and start to see these traits of myself that I had really been taught to believe were going to be barriers to me being accepted or celebrated or loved or or respected were things that a lot of people I really respected and loved in other people um, who are autistic as well. And I think when I was able to look at myself and feel confident in my understanding of myself, it was a lot easier to the fear of other people's interpretation was lessened. It's still difficult. I think for me, it was always harder in situations where I wouldn't be able to talk to them because I know that you're going to see this on a piece of paper and you're going to make a lot of judgments. And um, if I'm not there to counteract that, and that's all it's ever going to be. Um, but one of the things I've definitely done is uh, when I've been talking to people and mention I'm autistic and often get the pushback of, but you don't look slash sound slash seem slash appear slash all those many things of you don't really seem like what I imagine autism to be. And for me, that's always a response of being like, well, I'm not wrong about this. <laughs> so your idea of autism is wrong. If I can't fit into it, your idea is wrong. And I think um, <laughs> it's a matter of, Joe, I guess, 
recognizing that you haven't no you don't owe anyone that information but also if you feel like if it's making you feel uncomfortable like people are saying things around you that you're wondering if they would say something different if they knew or if you just feel like you have to actively hide it um i think it's that sense of similar to when people come out around their gender identity or sexuality you find a few people you want to talk to about it you get some support there you kind of build up that sense of self-worth and pride and then you can start to move through the world without um in a bit and it'll be a bit easier because often our fears of being reduced or judged can also come from our own struggles with how we feel about being autistic you know we talk about pride in this panel and i often think acceptance and tolerance is not the same as pride it's 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 still something you can take away you can take acceptance away because it's given and it's not quite the same as being proud of yourself and so uh, acceptance isn't the opposite of shame, pride is, and the road to pride is something that you can find with help. And there are a lot of autistic LGBTIQ plus groups and just like a spectrum intersections is a really great discussion group every month. That's entirely for neurodiverse LGBTIQA plus people. Kerry runs a group on Meetup. That might help as a place to start insofar as being out about autistic because being out about being autistic, it's a lot easier to be out when you aren't when someone not liking you or having the wrong idea is not going to change your sense of self. That would be my thoughts. Um, oh, we have an anonymous attendee who's asking, following the game question from Tim, what games do people with autism like playing? Are they turn-based? How about D&D? First bit, people with autism probably like playing any kind of game because if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. We don't have particular games that we like. I love D&D. I play a lot, I mean, six campaigns because I have commitment issues. But, um, but also that's not everyone's cup of tea either because it's a lot of talking and a lot of socializing. Um, so I think that also games that have structure and clear rules are usually good. Um, generally games that are fun, uh, we enjoy. Has anyone, what, what games do y'all play? Um, Carrie, what do you play? Um, I... That's an interesting point because I think the original question about games was more specifically about sport where um, where th this follow-up question has now broadened up to games in general where um, I, I I particularly like playing Scrabble. I run a Scrabble group on Meetup as well and also Mahjong which is a traditional Chinese game and I run a group for that as well where um yeah that you can see um yeah I don't this is why I never have any free time because I'm busy running all the groups but other than that yeah I like video games and a bunch of other things and oh I I like cycling as well but I don't do it competitively and um may I share an anecdote about uh of cycling in my transition so early on in my medical transition, my parents weren't very supportive of it. So I didn't really talk to them very much about it. But um, so um, I took testosterone to um, make myself look more masculine. But one of the other effects of testosterone is that um, it, all other things being equal, it inherently makes it easy for me to build muscle. And it actually also helps me um, it also changes fat distribution, but um, also all other things being equal, um, being on testosterone allows one to have a lower um, overall body fat percentage. And as a person who is already slim, being on testosterone has made me lose a bit of body fat. And um, so my pre-transition, my mother used to um, warn me quite a lot about um, not eating too much food because then that would make me fat and that's pretty unfortunate in itself but um, due to the testosterone I had lost some body fat and so instead my mother started um, worrying that I was becoming too skinny instead so um, just can't win either way. Uh, but you did win because now you're a cyclist on testosterone. <laughs> Uh, which uh, also I think one of the things about being a cyclist is that uh, most of my cycling groups were had the majority of people who are considerably older than myself and so it was pretty tricky um, navigating that social space and pre-transition I had a lot of um, romantic interest from 
older men and one of the good things about transitioning is that um uh, all that interest has disappeared and even pre people who with whom i've previously fallen out due to um their um having uh, i having turned down their advances um ha we had since made up and we are friends again that's great i am um... Only 10 minutes to go. I wanted to quickly ask Renee a question. Then we're going to answer a question that came in from the crowd about talking to kids about pronouns. Um, so Renee, uh, what have been some of the unexpected things that have come from working closely with LGBTIQA plus autistic people? And in the past year that you've been working with LGBTIQA plus autistic adults, including a lot of ICE, what are some of the things you'd like to see other allies and peers do more of? Yeah, thanks Ruby. And I first just wanted to say I'm just really honoured to be um, sitting amongst you all and hearing your stories this past almost hour. Um, I could probably say even in the last year I've learnt more about you just in this last hour than I have in all that time. So I guess that's one big learning. Um, but I guess really coming into the role of inclusion officer, I did not expect um, the, the impact of working with um, autistic adults and in particular autistic LGBTQI plus adults would have um, on both my learning but also the impact across aspect organisation. I mean we are we have our LGBTQI plus engagement plan commitment um, but I guess one of the biggest learnings was when um, I stepped into the role of the LGBTQI plus advisory committee which we have Kerry, Ruby and Yen who are all members um, and really kindly, both you, you've all were very generous with your time in helping get me up to speed on where you were at and what the challenges had been in the past in terms of how Aspect had managed the, the committee and what we'd hoped the committee to get out of it. And so I thank you all. I mean, you were so patient with me. And um, in that time, I've learned a great deal about just working in general and just slowing down. You know, those key things that we all really want to do in our work is to slow down and be present in what we're doing and just to listen. And um, the work I've been doing with autistic adults and LGBTQI plus people has really allowed me to, um, or forced me into doing that. Um, and, you know, hearing everybody's stories and the challenges that people have been going through, the complexities, things that we've even heard today, um, really helps um, cement what, what, why it's important that we're doing what we're doing. Um, a big shift for us was the Mardi Gras, where I worked with both Kerry um, and a number of, and a couple of other people within the committee and some aspect staff. And look, we, we spent hours and hours, and a lot of it was volunteer hours, um, working together, co-designing the plan, co-designing the float, um, engaging people across the country to march with us um, for the Mardi Gras. And of course, you mentioned the shirts, Ruby, you know, nothing about us without us was um, really a message that was driven home during that Mardi Gras event. And I could see from the people participating um, and hear from the feedback that that event was sometimes, was for some people the first time they truly felt like they belonged somewhere. And I think that's a big message. Um, last, we, we also had the Fair Day store. And I guess that relates as well. We had a lot of people coming up to our store throughout the day who were there for Fair Day. But when they saw that we were an autism stand, um, you know, we got so many questions from people asking about how they can understand their own identity better. And they were just so, so, so proud and pleased to see a presence there at the fair day. So that was another big thing. Um, I just really would love to see the peers that I work with um, getting involved. And everybody at Aspect is a lot of people at Aspect are showing that initiative and getting involved in projects such as the Mardi Gras. We recently had an Ida Hobbit Day, Recognition Day um, within our internal staff. And then of course this Pride Month event, which we've had a lot of engagement um, with. So I just encourage peers to also take that time and just um, listen and take the time to listen to autistic people. Um, we have so much to learn about different ways of working. It's incredible. and. Um, Another big thing I think I've learned is around the, the gendering. And I've learned that today as well from both Yen and um, you know, everybody here, just about, you know, it's it's not it's not too hard. You know, we have our gender stereotypes, but if this is important for people to have their pronouns um, correctly named, then it's up to 
allies and it's up to us. Um, we're working and we're working with autistic people. This is what is expected of us. So I really encourage people to practice because it does take practice when you're not um, that way inclined um, in terms of like your, the way that a non-autistic person learns. And I've learned that's another big learning um, that I just wanted to share. It, it kind of like a reflection, but a lot of the time in our committee meetings, you know, I'm one of maybe one or two non-autistic people there. And at the end of the meetings, the, the communication, the social interactions, I'm actually can often come away from those meetings feeling really quite tired and drained. And that's only a, a snippet of what I can imagine it could feel like for an autistic person in the community, in a mainstream school, in, even in um, you know, these sorts of panel events that we set up. Um, so yeah, I just really thank you all for your honesty and your openness and your time to um, help us as an organisation achieve our goals. Oh. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> um, I have uh, one question that came through, which was around um, kids. So would love, uh, uh, someone would, uh, who is this from? Melissa, I would love any advice and tips uh, right, talking to gender, about gender diversity with autistic kids in a group where one kid will be referred to. Uh, so one kid is you're obviously using gender neutral pronouns and is happy and wants this discussion to happen. But uh, uh, Melissa is aware that this is not discussed in many settings and also that some kids may be more rigid in their understanding of such things due to a whole lot of factors. So just a few quick, we've only got about four minutes. So just a few quick tips uh, if you'd like to share them. Thanks, Hayden. Hello. Um, yeah, I can give a little bit of advice. Obviously, I'm not a professional in, in this uh, area, but I have worked as a dance teacher um, and I have worked with autistic children when I worked in childcare and after school care. Um, and personally, um, it's not it's not as hard as you as you're worrying that it will be. I, I know that it's a big thing and it seems quite scary and difficult, but um, I've actually found autistic kids are so much easier, uh, so much better at understanding gender neutrality than, um, than uh, neurotypical children. Um, so when I've spoken to neurotypical children, I've had some very interesting questions um, about, but are you sure? And, but you're wearing pink, you can't be a boy. Boys don't wear pink um, and stuff like that. But when I've spoken to autistic kids, um, one of my favorite interactions was, you know, I said, I'm actually going to transition to be a boy. And they went, yeah, okay. And I was like, do you have any questions? And they went, no, dude, I'm, I'm playing video games. Can you go? Like, <laughs> and I just thought that was really, really cute. Um, you know, it, to them, they were like, yep, cool. Got it. Excellent. You know, um, and obviously, I mean, that's just one kid. But, you know, I have spoken to other autistic children and it's, it's really just... Um, like I said, autistic children are so much more open. Um, they're, they're generally less understanding about um, these social norms and social rules that society has. So it's actually going to be easier for you to explain uh, gender neutrality to them because they're not stuck in this whole rigid box. Um, so if you just explain to them like, hey, so-and-so is now going to start using they, them pronouns. Um, the reason for this is because they don't feel like their gender fits within what society is telling them to behave like. And you might get some questions. Um, you can look at some resources. Um, there's a really good one by Acon called TransHub, which has some sections about um, how to explain being trans or gender, gender diverse to children. Um, in case you do get some questions, you can have a look at that website with the children. Um, but for the most part, in my experience, personally as a person who went through transition around children some of who were autistic I actually found it much easier to explain to autistic children that I was trans um, I didn't get as many questions I for the most part I just got yep okay um, yeah that's 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 my experience awesome thank you uh, hopefully that was useful now we are only got two minutes to go so I'd really like if everyone could just have a really quick uh Think about what are some of the things in your life that give you pride and I, I know it's tricky but if you can keep this to five words that would be rad so um, I'm gonna start with uh, Yen what gives you pride what gives me pride my survival my being in the world and you know getting to nearly 46 years old and still be being here and making a difference for people and being part of an amazing autistic and queer community which is just absolutely awesome so and I would encourage 
autistic people, neurodivergent people to connect with your neurodiverse peer group. Because this Absolutely. Is Thank you. Uh, Tim, what brings you pride? Um, I guess being the first Australian trans man to land a wheelchair backflip, that's one thing. And also just... Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Being, being out on my own with my partner, we moved out about a year ago and we were doing really well. So that's two things that give me pride. Awesome. Thank you. Kerry, what brings you pride? Uh, so my bike brings me pride because um, I'm proud to be out there on my very colourful bike. Uh, my earmuffs bring me pride because... Um, yeah, Nothing makes me more visibly autistic like um, wearing my big green earmuffs in a party when I'm the only one actually wearing them. And also all the groups that I run and my job. Thank you. What, what brings you pride, Renee? Um, my job brings me pride, my family and my friends. And I just hope that, you know, that's, that's our whole life. So I, I would only wish that upon everyone else to be proud of um, their whole self and their whole life too. Hayden, what brings you pride? Um, bring, what brings me pride is being intersectional and having um, all these different parts that um, make up my identity. And um, being an activist brings me a lot of pride, being able to speak for my community and to support my community and break down colonization. And yeah, like just to be an autistic trans and queer person who's also Aboriginal, um, there's not enough of us out there in the public eye. And I want other autistic Aboriginal, um, sorry, autistic queer and trans Aboriginal children um, and young adults to have someone to look up to. So that, that brings me pride. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. And so we couldn't get to all the questions attendees, but thank you so much for coming along and happy Pride Month. And uh, yeah, enjoy your rainbows. Thanks, everyone. And yeah, check out, we've got, we've been posting some things in the chat about uh, helplines, so Lifeline, so it's like callback service and QLife. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to those two. And yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. Oh my gosh, the chat's going off. I know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying to like read all of them and I'm just, there's so many. Yeah, keep looking down because my, I have to chat on my second screen, it's down here. <laughs> and there, I mean, there's only, there's like, you know, so much more to say that we haven't had a chance to. I know, an hour goes really fast when everyone enjoys talking. <laughs> yeah, I was like, there's so much more that we can add. Um, but yeah, not wanting to take up too much time of other people's speaking time. And I was just like, ah, how do I keep this short? It's not that thing where you don't think of the thing you want to say until afterwards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've put my hand up a couple of times, but things have moved on. Mm. <laughs> I mean, earlier on, yeah, that question about uh, sport and stuff where, I mean, I think part of the question was also about like having with gyms and stuff being separate. I think, yeah, who, what people need really depends a lot. And uh, like one thing that's worse than places in general being not accessible is when a place that's advertised as being accessible and end up not living up to that promise. Yeah, for sure. Just um, remind everyone that um, we're still live. So just don't say anything private. <laughs> <laughs> that's the classic. I mean, oh, technically, yeah. I'm still talking about the topic. So no, I know. I just like, because I almost made that mistake. So I'm just like, just in case anyone else did the same thing I did. Yeah. <laughs> don't say anything mean about any of the attendees. <laughs> <laughs> Never. I love the attendees. That was awesome. Awesome. They're our family now. <laughs> I think it says a lot that also with the attendees, so, so many of them are um, actually autistic people themselves and have so much to say. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lovely comment in here um, from Lizzie that says, um, uh, i got to find it. It sounds like you need to do more panels because there's more to say. I'm on board with that. I think we should do more panels. This was really fun and apparently, well, not apparently, like obviously was really informative to people. And yeah, we do have so much more to say. So Absolutely. I'd be up for it. Mm -hmm. I'd be up for it too. <laughs> I'll definitely organise that. Um, I think there's lots, a lot of more opportunities to, um, to do events like this. Yeah. Um, what I might do actually is just close the um, session down and then um, we can meet for our debrief um, on another meeting. Um, yeah.
Can I just really quickly ask, while we still got the attendees, someone's yep. asking if there is an Aussie um, LGBTI plus and autistic group on Facebook. Um, yep. Is there one that we could share with them? There's yeah. So, oh, no, that's disability, not autism specific. Which, um, yeah. Pardon? I, could, I just thought of one, but it's disability rather than autism. Yeah. So uh, Spectrum Intersections, I would okay. recommend. Thank uh, you. Yeah, they do a monthly discussion group on Discord and they just have a Facebook page up there, which you can find and like through there. Um, yeah, I, I know that there are, I don't, I, I know there are a few disability rainbow groups, but I'm not, I think that's the only way I know that's specifically for neurodiversity. And yeah, the, that's the, the issue I was having. When, oh, sorry, Jan, I didn't mean to talk over you. Is that the one that Mel, Mel yes. does? Yes, yes. Mel and Rose. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, because I, I'd been asked by a few, um, people in my like outside of panels in my personal life did I know any because I'm autistic and queer and yeah I was struggling I was like well I know a bunch of yeah yeah things. I think that was why Mela made it they couldn't yeah play. <laughs> yeah we definitely need more um autistic groups for for queer people for sure mm -hmm. also different journeys um which is a yeah. social group they yeah. occasionally have been trying to do a few LGBTIQ zoom hangouts which I've been taught long to which are really fun so yeah, you can definitely check good. yeah it's um oh someone Spencer but I've forgotten her first name. <laughs> Isn't one of the good things about um, a lot of things being now online is that we are now able to attend events that are normally held a long way away. I haven't got to deal with the dread of leaving my own house. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>